Hi, good afternoon. Today is Thursday, November the 4th, 2021. My name is Ashley Glover, and I'm here with Vincent Russo. And this program is the tax laws aren't changing just yet. Thank you all for joining us. We are presenting this webinar exclusively for our Peace of Mind members. So again, thank you all very much for being here. Before we dive in, let's open up as always with some housekeeping items. To help minimize audio distractions, we have muted your microphones. I didn't see any questions submitted during registration, but we are taking your questions live. So please submit those through the Q&A window provided on your Zoom toolbar. We may address them as we go along, but if not, we've saved time at the end for Q&A. We should be together for about 30 to 45 minutes. We created a PowerPoint for the program, which we are showing on screen along with our webcams. We are recording this and we'll email you today's video. There will be a webinar survey that pops up on your browser once we conclude. Uh, we thank you in advance for answering a few questions. If anyone has questions about the housekeeping, send me a message in the chat window. So now let's introduce our speaker, Vincent J. Russo. As many of you probably know, Vincent is the firm's managing partner. He has a Master of Law in Taxation. He's a nationally recognized speaker and author on elder law, special needs, and estate planning. He's a founding member, fellow, and fifth president of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys. He's also co-founder of the Teresa Alessandra Russo Foundation for Children with Special Needs, which was established in the memory of his daughter. So Vincent, thank you for being here. How are we feeling today? Everything we're feeling, good? We're feeling great. Actually, we're feeling really good because of what happened uh, about a week uh, or so ago. So um, this is a very important topic for those who are concerned about estate taxation. And uh, today, what I'll do is just give you a quick overview of what was proposed um, on the estate tax side, uh, then get into really um, highlighting for you the strategies to save uh, estate taxes. There are a number of strategies that we can implement. I think you'll find them very valuable. And then why plan now? Um, and so uh, this is going to be... Um, really giving you the insights, cutting edge, where we are with the current proposals, what can be done today, and why should you do it now versus waiting on acting on any sort of estate tax planning. So thank you, Ashley. Um, and I, I'm gonna leave my, I can leave my video up and do the PowerPoint. You can. Okay, yeah. all right. All right, all right. I'm gonna take it away. Um, so the overview of the estate tax proposal, as, as you may uh, all know, that uh, the uh, Build Better Back bill um, had a number of tax um, uh, proposals that would have dramatically impacted one's ability to do estate tax planning and also the cost of the estate tax itself. So let's talk about what was proposed. First was uh, that the, and there have been various proposals kicking around over the past um, eight months or so, uh, but this was what was in the House bill uh, initially, uh, that the federal estate and gift tax exemption would be ratcheted down from $11,700,000 to $6 million. So that would have a dramatic impact on anyone who had assets between 6 million and 11.7. In the bill was a proposal to raise the estate tax rate, which is currently 40% to 45%. The next area was an attack on the estate planning strategies, in particular using trusts, what we call grantor trusts. So we're gonna get into that today, uh, but there spousal lifetime access trusts, SLATs, qualified personal residence trusts, Cuperts, grantor retained annuity trusts, GRATs, and irrevocable life insurance trusts, ILETs. Also an attack on the discounting of gifts. Um, and one of the techniques is setting up a limited liability company, an LLC, creating voting and non-voting units, 
gifting the non-voting units at a discounted value. The last piece was on the capital gains tax side, uh, that the capital gains tax rate would be increased to 25%. And with the surtax on the net investment income, in effect, it would have became 28.3%. So the good news. The good news is that the 100 or so pages of these tax proposal, proposed legislative uh, changes on the taxes were ripped out of the bill. And in replacement of this uh, were provisions to increase the corporate tax and to tax uh, billionaires. Um, so the, that's really good news unless you're a billionaire. And if you are, I'd like to get to know you. Please call me after, after the presentation today. So the really good news, we don't have today to worry that before the enactment of this better Build Better Back bill, that we would have needed to implement all these strategies and get grandfathered. We now have some time uh, to make appropriate uh, state planning changes in, in the estate plan that you have to minimize overall taxes. We need to be mindful that there is a sunset provision on that federal estate and gift tax exemption. What that means is the legislation is slated to um, revert the existing exemption amount, which will get adjusted by inflation over the next few years, and revert back to approximately $6 million come January 1st of 2026. So anything can happen in between now and 2026. Congress can always go back and um, implement further legislation and, and make um, these proposals come, become reality. For now, that's not the case. But we do know that unless affirmative legislative action is taken in 2026, that exemption is coming down. We also know that by using the exemption now, you will get the benefit of the exemption with no clawback. So the IRS has said that if someone hypothetically used $11 million of their exemption, and then it reverted back down to six, that additional $5 million um, would have been exempted and there would be significant estate tax savings by doing that. So let's just jump into some of the strategies to save on estate taxes. And today, uh, my, my goal is to uh, give you really the highlights. And if any of these items resonate with you, then you should give us a call and let's sit down with you uh, and then drill down one-on-one -on, -one on what uh, makes sense for you um, and explore any of these strategies that you're interested in. When doing estate planning, uh, we have to start at the beginning. Uh, and so the first would, uh, step would be to um, come up with the size of your estate. What, what's the over value, overall value of your estate? And when you meet with us, uh, it's confidential. There's an attorney-client privilege. And so uh, we want real numbers. Um, we don't want a low ball, uh, a home that may have increased significantly over the last two years um, um, and have a lesser number. Uh, it's, it's between you uh, and us, you and, and us, and we'll make sure that we're gonna minimize estate taxes for you. And we're not necessarily gonna um, utilize the values you give us as we implement, but you, we need to have the reality of your estate situation. We also need to know about all your assets. Um, so that's step one. We then look at the size of your estate and consider whether you have an, a taxable estate. You could have a New York taxable estate or a federal taxable estate or both, right? So we would wanna see, well, what is the tax? We do a tax calculation. So we could tell you that God forbid, if something happened to you today, this is what your tax liability would be for your family. 
What we're looking to do is maximize how you leave your assets to your family, loved ones, um, and charities, if that's your desire. You may have heard about step up in basis lately. In fact, I was on CFN Live, uh, which is a, uh, a cable uh, program that I'm periodically on as a guest contributor. And I'll be on uh, next month uh, dealing with the uh, tax issues again. And so step up in basis is a great concept that if you do not have a taxable estate, for example, then you don't really want to give your assets away because you lose what's called the step up in basis. So if you have assets that appreciate in value and then you sell them, there's a capital gain and that gain is subject to tax. So if I bought a uh, Apple at, and I bought $10,000 worth of it, now it's worth 100,000. I have a $90,000 gain. And if I was to sell it today, I would have to pay tax on that $90,000. But if I leave the Apple stock to family, then there's a what's called a step up in basis. My basis, the cost of what I paid for the Apple stock, steps up to the fair market value at date of death. So if I passed away and that Apple stock was worth 100, the basis is 100. Now, if the family sold that stock at 100, basis 100, zero gain, zero tax. So if I was to use an example of a 28% tax and someone had $100,000 of gain that, were, that now they're going to have to account for, that's $28,000 in taxes. If I have it as a step up in basis, I've avoided that $28,000 tax. Now that concept often comes up with houses because houses may have appreciated hundreds of thousands of dollars. And now you would want to take advantage of the step up in basis. But once you have a taxable estate, we know the estate tax rate is at 40%, which is much higher than the capital gain tax rate. So then we do want to do some further planning. If you're a resident of New York, we have to be aware that New York doesn't line up with the federal exemption. Their exemption is lower. And there's a concept called the cliff, which I'll get into and show you an example. So anyone with an estate of over 5 million would want to make sure that they're doing New York State estate tax planning. Um, and also to make sure they plan so that they don't fall off the cliff. No one wants to fall off a cliff. Um, clearly, gifting strategies and the use of trust are important tools in our toolkit that can save estate taxes. And asset allocation is equally important, especially for New York residents. If you're married, how you hold your assets can have a dramatic impact whether you have to pay thousands of dollars in estate taxes or pay no estate taxes to New York. So that's really important, asset allocation. Here again, anyone over $5 million needs to be paying attention to these issues. So let me give you an example of a taxable estate. The federal tax rate is 40%. The New York state uh, estate tax rate is 16%. The exemption in federal level is 11,700,000. So if, I, if someone passed away today, I don't want to stop, keep killing myself off. If someone passed away today, then, um, and they had an estate of under 11,700,000, there would be no federal estate tax. If they passed away with an estate of over 5,930,000, there's a New York tax. That New York tax at 16% on the excess amount above 5,930,000. But if that New Yorker has an estate of $6,226,500, they now have fallen off the cliff. And New York takes away the $5,930,000 exemption and taxes you from dollar one. So there are techniques to get around falling off the cliff if your estate falls 
in and around that $6 million number, and you would want to talk to us about it. Now, let me give you an overall example of kind of what these taxes might look like depending on the size of your estate. And I'm using the tax rate and the exemption levels for this year, 2021. So if you have an estate of under 5,930,000, the good news is there are no taxes. If you have an estate under that amount and you have appreciating assets, you may still want to do estate tax planning. If you hit the cliff number, $6,226,500, no federal tax, but look at that New York tax, $538,992. There is a way to avoid that. See us if you haven't taken steps. At 11,700,000, good news, no federal tax. Look at that New York tax. $1,338,800. That single person had 23,400,000. Now we're talking about over $3 million to the feds, over $3 million to New York. That's $6 million on $23 million. Uncle Sam now is a family member and they're taking a big piece of your estate. The last, row at 23,400,000 for a married couple, if they separated their assets between them equally, you have still 2.6 plus million in New York estate taxes. Staggering numbers. So who should do estate tax planning? People with estates over 5,930,000 people who will likely have a taxable estate due to asset appreciation or inheritances. Maybe you have $4 million today, but you're going to at some point be inheriting from parents several million, and that'll push you over that number. As I said, the federal estate tax exemption is at 11.7, but it's gonna be lowered to roughly 6 million in 2026 unless Congress acts or sooner. And that's a reason to do planning now. In 2026, once again, very important, scheduled to reduce the federal estate gift, uh, state and gift tax exemption. So where are the tax planning opportunities? There are several, um, I'm gonna talk big picture opportunities here. Clearly gifting to individuals or to trusts. Those are what I'll call dollar for dollar gifts. You also could make discounted gifts. Life insurance trusts. If you have life insurance, it's income tax-free, but not estate tax-free. So by taking your policy and moving it into a trust avoids taxation on that insurance. Also, the insurance can be used to pay for any estate taxes. So life insurance trust avoids estate taxation while funding any estate tax that may be due. If you're married, credit shelter and marital trusts are trusts that we use in wills or in revocable living trusts, where we can take, make sure we take advantage of the exemption in each of the spouse's estates. So anyone who's married with an estate of over 5 million should be building into their plan credit shelter and marital trusts. And then that asset allocation. Here again, if married, taking advantage of the New York state exemptions by making sure that you uh, alloc allocate the assets between uh, spouses. New York does not have what's called portability. Unlike the federal law, which says, if you don't use your exemption while you're alive, you, the um, estate can file an estate tax return, no taxes owed, and the unused exemption can be used by the surviving spouse. In New York, that's not the case. That's why asset allocation in New York is so important. If you have any questions, because I know I'm moving fairly quickly, um, just use the Q&A and let me know, or you can follow up after the presentation with myself or any of the attorneys that you've worked with in the office. 
So let's talk about some of the gift tax strategies that save estate taxes. All right, first, discounting gifts. I love discounting gifts. Wouldn't it be nice if I can make a gift of a dollar and have the IRS think I only gifted 60 cents? So I'm, losing le I'm using less of the exemption amount. Um, so I'm putting that gift on steroids. So there, there are concepts like Gratz and Cupert's that are trusts that will allow you to put a house or your liquid assets into it and get a discount. There's also a technique with setting up an LLC, a limited liability company, and then gifting the ownership in that LLC in a way that there's a discount. Those are good techniques if you are looking to reduce the size of your estate and or avoid um, having the appreciation subject to estate taxation while retaining some interest in that trust, some benefit for a period of time. There's another concept called SLATS, Spousal Lifetime Access Trust. This is where someone says to me, I, I don't want my future appreciation in my liquid assets to be subject to estate tax. This trust will allow you to do get around that. And or someone says to me, you know, I like this idea of saving taxes, but I really need an access to the income or the principal or what happens if there is an emergency. So a spousal lifetime access trust works very well for married couples. Also single individuals can uh, utilize a spousal lifetime access trust uh, with a family member. If you have a, a larger estate subject to estate tax, Dynasty trust makes sense, generation skipping. So why pass assets on that is subject to tax in your estate, then to your children. And when they pass away, it's subject to their estate and, and taxes. And then the grandchildren get a really small percentage of your overall estate. Uh, and then charitable gifting and trust, there are provisions in the tax laws that give you the opportunity to um, help a charity uh, and either avoid taxation at the estate level. And it also can be a technique to avoid taxation on capital gains. In addition, by making the gift, you get a discount, a, a deduction on your personal income tax return that also can save taxes. So um, these are some of the tools in the toolkit. So let's, uh, talk about four of them today, the alphabet soup of estate tax planning, Gratz, Cupid, Slats, and Islets. There are more. There are Idgets, for example. Um, and when you have a, even a larger estate, um, we would talk to you about Idgets, intentionally defective grantor trust. So a grant is a trust that is set up where you fund it with assets. Let's say you took a million dollars and you put it into a grant. And, and now it's being managed by the trustee. That can be another family member. It's earning uh, income, it's appreciating in value. So in the typical situation, if you gave away a million dollars, you made a million dollar gift. But in this grant, you've retained the right for a term of years to receive a certain percentage each year like an annuity payment. So if I had a million dollars and I said, I want a 5% return to me, that's $50,000 a year. So I'm gonna get $50,000 a year out of the grant, let's say payable quarterly. And once I outlive that term of years, the assets in that trust are no longer part of my estate. So the term of years, would be something less than your life expectancy. So if I had someone 70 years old, they could say, I want a, a term of 10 years. So for 10 years, they're gonna be getting that $50,000. Once they outlive the 10 years, they, they no longer would be getting that 50,000. It would be out in the trust for the benefit of the family. 
um, because they retain the right to receive that $50,000 for 10 years, there would be a discount on the gift. So we'd have to run a calculation. And so that gift of a million dollars will be something less than a million dollars. So it's a way of maximizing your gift, retaining an income interest, um, and getting a certain level of return. You decide on the term and the rate of return, the percentage. All right, so we work with families, figure out what one is comfortable with in terms of how much they'd like to put in the grant and what kind of return they would want and how many years would they wanna keep that annuity payment. The next one's a qualified personal resident trust or a cupid. This is where you put your primary residence or second home in a trust and you retain the right to live in the house for the term of years. Here again, there's a discount based on your age, what's called the 7520 rate, which changes each month, the federal government gives us that number, um, and the number of years of the term. All right, so once we know those, those facts, once we decide on that, we can calculate the discount. This is set up as what's called a grantor trust. So when you outlive the term and the house now is appreciated during the term and is now out of your estate, then what happens is um, you can stay in the house and rent the house at fair market value. You pay rent to the trust. It's a non-taxable event. The rent being fair market value should more or less cover, you know, the the real estate taxes and the uh, insurance on the house and the upkeep. So you in effect get to live there for the rest of your life if you want to. If it's um, if you are in that arrangement, uh, then basically the trustees taking the rent payments and maintaining the house. As I said, there's no taxable event occurring the way it's structured. So. A cupid with a residence or, or a primary residence or a vacation home can really be an ideal vehicle because you're not really um, being adversely impacted by the arrangement being set up in that you made a gift. A discounted gift, use up some of your exemption, outlive the term, you get it out of your estate. The house can be sold during the term and a new house purchased. But if there's any cash remaining in that cupid, then you actually get an annuity payment during the remainder of the term. So that works really well. Let's talk about SLATs. As I mentioned, this is a spousal lifetime access trust and is really a terrific vehicle. I mean, I would say that over the last month, more clients have asked me about SLATs than any other technique. It's a way of freezing the value of the, of the assets you gift, gift away so that future appreciation uh, is not subject to um, taxation while, while allowing access to the income and or the principal for the benefit of the spouse. So let me give you an example. Um, I had a client who took $5 million, put it into a slab. Um, they, they um, made that transfer, um, let's say eight years ago, and now it's worth um, $9 million. The $4 million that that slat has appreciated is not subject to estate tax. And if I use 50% just as a number, um, $2 million of taxes have been saved. It's set up so that if, the, if there was any need for the assets or the income, it can be paid back out to the spouse and the spouse can also be the trustee. So there's a lot of flexibility. Some married couples will set up two slats, husband for wife, wife for husband. Um, there's some technical uh, provisions we have to work into that document, but it hedges on, we don't know which spouse is gonna pass away first. So it's a terrific vehicle if you're married um, and are looking to keep some control over accessing 
principal and, and uh, income. And then lastly, as I mentioned, the ILITs and the Irrevocable Life Insurance Trust, everyone, if you have an insurance policy in your name, and you've got a taxable estate, get right into our office, set up an ILIT, get that insurance out of your estate. There's a three-year rule. If you already have the policy, then uh, it's, in, it's excluded from your estate after you transfer it in three years past. Some of my clients say, I'm interested in, in insurance. They set up the islet and the trustee buys the policy and then there's no um, a three year rule. How do the premiums get paid? You make gifts annually into the trust to pay the premiums. But it will remove the insurance from your estate. And also when that policy pays out, if there are any estate taxes owed indirectly, you can use that insurance money. So for example, I'm working with a client right now where most of their estate is real estate. And so they don't wanna to have to sell real estate and pay an estate tax when they pass away because the market might be down. It may not be the right time where they really want the family to keep that asset. Estate taxes have to be paid as a general rule nine months from date of death. So there isn't a lot of time to come up with the money, the tax money. So insurance can be a vehicle to help do that as well. Lastly, I want to just mention non-tax reasons for estate plan. Um, clearly, you want to have an estate plan that passes assets on to family without problems. And if you want to avoid probate, uh, that could be helpful too. So if you're a client with wills, you want, may want to consider converting your estate plan to uh, revocable living trust uh, and then move your assets into that trust. It's revocable. You're the trustee. You maintain total control of it and you avoid probate. I think what we've learned from COVID um, pandemic is that uh, when people passed away, if they had wills, the courts were shut down and it took a long time for the will to be probated and an executor appointed. When you have a revocable living trust, you name a successor trustee and they step in right away and there's no delay in accessing those assets. Also, another non-tax reason would be leaving assets in a protective way for family. You know, their divorce rate is at 52%. Uh, we're a litigation happy country. Uh, there are creditors that may be out there uh, potentially. Uh, undue influences. Lots of things, bad things can happen to good people. So we've created what we call the safe trust or the family protection trust concept for family members to keep assets in a more protective way. If you have a child or a family member with special needs, uh, you'd want to set up a special needs trust to protect that loved one. And if you're concerned about long-term care, you're getting up in years and are concerned about long-term care and want to potentially, if there was a need, you want to make sure you could qualify for government benefits like Medicaid, or maybe even consider buying long-term care insurance, um, then that would be another reason to make sure that your estate plan is comprehensive, putting aside all of the tax reasons I addressed earlier. So lessons learned here are that there are various uh, strategies that are available to save estate taxes. I always say to my clients, you need to make a commitment uh, when you're looking to save estate taxes, a commitment of time, energy, and resources. There are going to be legal fees. There may be other out-of-pocket fees uh, related to the plan. And we need your uh, cooperation in, in the, having all the documentation available to us and the information we need to make sure we're making the right recommendations. So <clears throat> we, that commitment is important. And lastly, and most importantly, you need to be comfortable with any estate plan that you have. Um, we don't want to uh, have a, a tax estate, ta an estate tax plan 
makes, you know, imp be implemented for you. And then you're not sleeping at night because you're not comfortable with the steps you took. So it's really important to us that we listen to you. We understand what your objectives are. Um, and then we implement an estate plan that you're going to be comfortable with. Now, all of you have implemented as peace of mind clients. I'm sure all of you have implemented a state plan. And I see the value of, of the peace of mind program being that it gives us a chance at least once every year to um, take a look at your plan, make sure we've crossed T's, dotted I's, made sure we've got the absolute best plan for you and your family, answer any questions that you might have whether they're directly related to your estate plan or other legal questions. We've created a lot of resources. Um, we work with a number of other attorneys. We have up counsel relationships. So, you know, if someone had a personal injury or a potential malpractice, or they've got a corporate matter, or there's um, a matrimonial issue, um, we, we can be a resource to you and help you. So what do you do now? Uh, look at your plan. Um, it says create a plan. Um, you have a plan. Look at your plan. Uh, make sure your legal uh, documents are meeting your desires. Let's make sure it's comprehensive. And then if we need to go the next step from your existing plan, let's move now. Let's not wait uh, and do it in crisis, in a crunch time. Uh, we don't know what might happen legislatively out into the future. Right now, we seem to have a pause. While we're in this pause, let's take an opportunity uh, to be forward thinking, um, to make sure we minimize Uncle Sam or eliminate him from your estate plan. Uh, so, you know, my recommendation would be uh, come see us, uh, call us, um, and let's get together and, and see what's going on. Um, and, and then make recommendations accordingly. So I've given you um, fairly quickly, a really, I think, big picture overview of where we are with the tax laws, um, what strategies are available, and, and some of the issues you may want to think about personally as to whether that motivates you to take another step here. All of our peace of mind clients are, um, are uh, able to have at least the, we want to have an annual meeting review. If you haven't taken advantage of it, please do. Um, Ashley, I'm not seeing any questions at the moment. No, sir. No questions in the Q&A or the chat window. Okay. So uh, hopefully it wasn't too quick. And uh, if you're not clear about anything I've said, uh, please call Ashley and she'll connect you to me or one of the attorneys. Um, and we'll make sure we address any questions that you have. I look forward to uh, seeing you in our office. We are open and we're still doing Zoom meetings as well. So if you feel you wanna save some time uh, or feel more comfortable health-wise, um, we can do Zoom meetings, we can do telephone conferences. And with that, have a great day as we move into the uh, fall season. It, got, it was cool out there today. Uh, Ashley, you're in Houston, Texas, and it was, uh, it was 39 degrees this morning when I walked uh, John the dog. Uh, so it's getting, getting cooler here. Uh, everybody be safe and be well. Bye.